Today is your lucky day. The champ uploaded a new video and you found it. I'm joking. It's your lucky day because Islamnet is establishing a mega masjid and da'wah center and you have a unique opportunity to be part of that. So click the link below and donate now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you guys doing? And welcome to the most inconsistent podcast in the world, the MH podcast. But actually, it's becoming a little bit more consistent. And I'm here joined with someone that probably to you guys does not need an introduction, but I'll give it anyway. He's a historian, he's a person who is one of the premier debaters of the Muslim world. He has debated some of the top guys uh, in the Christian world and in other faith traditions as well, and has come on top. I'm talking about none other than. The one and only Adnan Rashid. How are you doing? Okay, mashallah. Thank you so much for having me. Of course, of course, man. You know, it's I think long overdue. A lot of people have been asking me to do this kind of um, thing with you. And now, because we've got the conflict, um, let's not call it the conflict. Let's call it the oppression of the Palestinian people. We've got the oppression of the Palestinian people. People, It's piqued people's interest in terms of um, exactly the history of Palestine, the history of Jewish people, the history of, of the interaction between Muslim people and Jewish people. Today, we want to focus on some of the interactions between Muslim people and Jewish people, because the narrative, there is one narrative which is quite sinister and insidious, which seems to indicate that the Muslim project, not Hamas or any of these groups, no, the Muslim project itself is one that attempts to kill off all of the Jewish people and that Islam is intolerant of Jews and that the historical record uh, basically shows that. So how would you, and you've debated this issue as well um, with, with prominent individuals and less prominent individuals as well, um, how would you debate this issue? How would you make a builder case for the contrary point of view? So, a lot of the Zionist propagandists, they mm. come up with this idea that Islam is inherently anti-Jewish. This is what they claim. Therefore, we need a homeland, we need to protect ourselves, we need to take land from the Palestinians and build our own ancient uh, homeland. Uh, or homeland that was ancient, we need to reclaim it, we, we need to take it back. And they quote biblical verses in this regard uh, to to claim that they have possession or they have right over this land. Okay, So we show them that Muslims ruled the land of Palestine in particular and much of the land around it for, for nearly a thousand years mm. with an iron fist, mm. with strength with mm. military presence, mm. with economic dominance, mm. with educational uh, uh, inspiration mm. and all those things. Muslims did great things. Islamic civilization or the Muslim civilization was one of the greatest things that happened in this region. Okay, the question now is, how did the Muslim civilization treat the Jewish people that as an question. entity, yeah. as a community? Yeah. And those Zionists who are claiming this today propagandists, mm. liars, outli outright liars yes. who claim this, that the Jewish people suffered suffered under the rule of Islam. So we cannot be ruled by the Muslims. Mm. Okay. Mm. If the Palestinians want their land back and uh, they want all of it back, the Israelis come back and say, you cannot have all of it back because you will kill all of us. Okay. For example, so yeah. when yeah, for example, when people Palestinians when they want this land back, the Israelis come back and say, "Oh, that means a genocide of the Jewish people." This is the game a lot of these Zionist propagandists play deliberately, quite deliberately. Right. They claim that if the Palestinians are to come back to their lands and take their lands uh, lands back, that means automatically a genocide of the Jewish people because Jewish people are not safe under Palestinians or the Muslim people in general. We want to undo that notion today. We want to present evidence to the contrary and show how the civilization of Islam or the Muslim civilization saved the Jewish people for over a thousand years. What do I mean by saved the Jewish people? Saved them from whom? Mm. Okay. Jewish people lived within the domain of Islam for over a thousand years. In fact, the majority of them lived within the domains of Islam. Some of them lived in Christian lands and they were being persecuted, they were being killed off, they were being exiled, they were being brutalized. There are so many examples I can cite in this regard. In fact, to give you one example, Hijab, mm. when the Muslims arrived in Spain mm. in the year 711 CE, 
Mm -hmm. A Jewish historian called Zion Zohar, who is an American Jewish historian, mm -hmm. he writes in his book, A History of Sephardic and Mitzrayi Jewry, on page 8 and 9, he writes that men, history of? A his, history of Sephardic and Mitzrayi Jewry. Mm. Okay. Uh, basically, this is a history of the Sephardic Jews. Mm. Okay. Sephardic Jews are basically Jews who lived in the Middle East, mainly, or in the Muslim lands. Yeah. So, in this history on page 8 and page 9, he states, when the Muslims arrived at Gibraltar mm -hmm. in 711 CE, mm -hmm. the Jewish people welcomed them as liberators. Mm -hmm. So, who were they being liberated from is the question. Now, if you go back to Christian history of Spain, you will see in the year 633 CE, almost 80 years before the Muslims arrived, there was a council, a Catholic ecumenical council held in the city of Toledo. This was called the Fourth Council of Toledo. In this council, when was this? 633 CE. Mm -hmm. In this council, I mean, anyone can Google the Fourth Six. Council, 633 CE, yep. uh, exactly a year after the Prophet of Islam passed away. That's right. Yeah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Islam. Okay. Mm. In this council, it was decreed by the Catholic Church that all the children of the Jewish people are to be taken away by force and they are to be converted to Catholicism and are to be raised as pious Catholics by Catholics. In other words, forced conversion of the Jewish people and the children. This is the kind of persecution, destruction and brutality the Jewish people were facing yes. in Spain before the Muslims arrived. Therefore, when the Muslims came in 711 CE, almost 80 years after this, con uh, this, uh, this particular Catholic council, the Jewish people welcomed the Muslims as liberators. And this is confirmed by Jewish scholars, Jewish historians today. Zain Zohar. Zain Zohar is one of them, as quoted. So this was the attitude of the Jewish people who were being liberated from Christian persecution by the Muslims. Mm -hmm. And this happened even in the land of Palestine. When the second caliph of Islam, Umar bin Khattab, an, when he took the land of Palestine from the Byzantines, from the Romans, one of the clauses in the treaty that was agreed upon between the Christians and the Muslims at the time was that the Muslims will not bring the Jewish people into the city of Jerusalem with them. The Christians did not want the Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem. The text of the treaty can be found in the history of Tabari. Okay. It is there. Tariq yeah, Tariq al Tabari, the text of the treaty is there. Mm. And one of the clauses put by the Christians mm. as a special request from the Muslims was that you will not allow the Jewish people to come and live in the city of Jerusalem. Later on, having consolidated their power, the Muslims welcomed the Jewish people into the city of Jerusalem to come and live side by side with the, the Muslims. And Thomas Arnold Walker also mentions this in his uh, preaching of Islam as well, doesn't he? Absolutely. Absolutely. Karen Armstrong. Karen Armstrong, who has written a history of Jerusalem. Mm. In that history, she specifically writes mm. that it was under the system of Islam whereby the three Abrahamic faiths coexisted for the first time in history. Mm. It was under the rule of Islam. It was the system is, of Islam that facilitated this peaceful coexistence. Now, was it hijab? The question is now, was it just toleration, tolerance, or was it prosperity for the Jewish people? Before we get there, hmm. let, let's play devil's advocate. Someone's going to say, well, you're mentioning all the the points where Jewish people were welcomed in. Hmm. But if you look, for example, you talked about Spain, someone can just bring up the Muahidun and hmm. say, look, the Muahidun were a hmm. very intolerant bunch. And in hmm. fact, they expelled the Jewish yeah. people and hmm. uh, dealt them a very heavy hand. Absolutely. There are cases... There are incidents whereby some Jewish people, some yeah. communities were targeted by some kings and some dynasties. But these were exceptional cases. See. This was not the norm of the Muslim civilization. And, and you're, not, you're not denying that. You're, you, you accept that the, there have been some of those people because some will say, well, in the beginning you said it's always been good. But you're saying that there's exceptions to the rule and you wouldn't discount those because someone's watching that and say, but what about this and what about yeah, that? First of all, we're not claiming a utopia. Yeah, We're not claiming a utopia. We're not claiming perfection. We're yeah. not saying that it was always 100% yeah. uh, absolutely amazing. No. Mm. What we are saying is that overwhelming uh, 
pattern, let's say, yes. the overwhelming, um, um, the overwhelming condition uh, or the condition of the Jewish people was positive overwhelmingly, okay, to put it in the right way, okay. The Jewish people from the very advent of Islam in Arabia all the way up to the 1930s coexisted with the Muslims peacefully. In mm. fact, they felt protected. They felt that they are prosperous. They felt that they are safe. So this what is other the examples point. of prosperity can you bring to the table? Then? Th there are so many. And yeah. I will quote some of the Jewish testimonies in this regard. Sure. Okay, if me and you sit here and talk today and speak on behalf of the Muslim civilization and praising it and paying lavish tributes to it, that's going to be seen as bias. Of course. Okay, this is, this is basically prejudice speaking. These Muslim propagandists yeah. sitting there in front exactly. of the camera exactly. they are just they, i'm not going to do that yeah. job today no, but what, gonna... you, what you've done is you frankly you've 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 quoted an academic resource of a jewish scholar like absolutely Zohar. so far that's what you've done then you quoted uh, karen armstrong who's a non-muslim uh, english uh, scholar of uh, academic exactly and i have a lot more i have a plethora of quotes and testimonies from uh, primary sources yeah. jewish rabbis and jewish travelers really? who were living in those times in those places in those cities under those dynasties mm. what they had to say about the muslim treatment towards the jewish people and then later on secondary sources modern scholarship also confirms those testimonies mm. only the zionist project only the zionist project has a problem with this mm -hmm. only the zionists have an agenda mm. to reject this entire history only they question the notion of the, the golden age of the house of Israel under Islam. Hmm. Only they are the ones who question this because it dismantles their propaganda. It, dis, it, it, it dismantles their narrative. Hmm. What is the narrative? The Jewish people are perpetually threatened by the, 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 the rule of Islam. The Jewish people basically are in danger from the Muslims or the Palestinians for that matter. Yeah. Okay. We will show that throughout history, for over a thousand years, the Jewish people not only lived peacefully with the Muslims or under the rule of Islam, but prospered. Mm. So they became you, very happy and successful. You are at the 7th and 8th century. You, you mentioned 7-11, that's 8th century. And then you mentioned kind of like the time of Amr al-Khattab, which is about the 7th century. So, okay, you've, you've mentioned what's happening, say, in the Middle East and all the way up to Spain in that period of time. Yes. What if someone says, well, okay, that was... In the beginning, but then things started taking a different turn. Um, that that's not the case because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna produce evidence yeah. from different places, yes, and different times, okay. And this evidence is going to give us pretty much the same picture, okay. That the condition of the Jewish people remained pretty, uh, pretty good throughout the history of the Muslim civilization. Yes, there were incidents where some Jewish people, for a number of different reasons, were targeted uh, due to their political activism or other things, okay? Yeah. And many of these things happened because of political reasons, mm. okay? But if you look at Jewish people as a community, merchants, traders, scholars, mm. okay, physicians, they flourished throughout the history of Islam with the Muslims. And we're going to see the evidence, inshallah, very quickly. First thing I want to very quickly uh, bring to attention uh, for everyone to see is how did the Jewish people feel under the rule of Islam? Mm. Okay, um, so the Zionist propaganda is that Jewish people are threatened. Mm. Okay, they, they will never be safe under the rule of Islam or with the Muslims. We will show that's not the case. To the contrary, if the Jewish people ever flourished uh, throughout the history of diaspora, you know what diaspora is? Mm. Diaspora is Jewish exile from the Holy Land. Mm. In the year 132 CE, Emperor Hadrian banished the Jewish people from the land of Palestine on pain of death. If any Jew was found in the land of Palestine mm. by the Roman authorities after this decree, that Jew would be killed on the spot. Yeah. Okay. So this happened after a famous revolt called the Revolt of Bar Kokhba. Mm -hmm. This took place when Emperor Hadrian, the Roman Emperor, mm. one of the most powerful Roman emperors was ruling. Uh, from Rome, Hadrian, and the city of Jerusalem was completely razed to the ground and renamed Elia after the name of the Roman Emperor Elias Hadrianus. Okay, so since then the Jewish people were scattered all over the world. 
They were scattered. This is what the Jewish people refer to as the diaspora. Okay, the Jewish people suffered severely under the Roman rule, firstly, and then the Christian rule, because the Christians were also anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic. Why? Because they blamed the Jewish people are doing what? Killing their God. Killing yeah. God. Yeah. Okay, what we call diecide. Mm. Okay, so the Jewish people were accused of killing Jesus Christ. Mm. So his crucifixion, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was instigated according to the Gospels, by the way. Mm -hmm. If you read the Gospel text, mm. it has two people mm. uh, blamed for the, the crucifixion and the brutalization of Jesus Christ. The Jewish people, the rabbis, the Jewish authorities of the city of Jerusalem and the Roman authorities. Okay, so the Jewish people suffered first under the Romans, then the Christians came to power after some Roman emperors accepted Christianity. They converted to Christianity. They started to persecute the Jewish people. It was not until Islam came to the scene that the Jewish people could find some respite, mm. some refuge, some level of peace and tolerance where they could flourish, where they could produce scholars, poets, merchants, traders, rabbis, okay, theologians, uh, intellectuals, politicians, prime ministers, mm -hmm. prime ministers. To give you one example, in the, ninth, in the 10th century, the most powerful king in Western Europe was a man called Abdurrahman III, who was the caliph mm. in Spain, Spain mm -hmm. who ruled much of Spain. Mm -hmm. And guess who his prime minister was? Mm. This was a very powerful man called Hazdai ibn Chaprut. Mm. Hazdai ibn Chaprut was the, the prime minister of mm. the Muslim Caliph in Cordoba mm -hmm. because Cordoba was the center of the Caliphate, the Umayyad Caliphate in Spain. Mm. In 929, Abdurrahman III declared himself to be the Caliph of the Muslim world and his Prime Minister was none other than a Jewish man called Hazdai ibn Chaprut. Hazdai ibn Chaprut, when he was the, the Vizier, yes. uh, the Prime Minister, he wrote a letter to the Jewish King of Khazars which was a territory near Georgia today. Mm. And he writes in this letter from Al-Andalus, mm. Praise be to the beneficent God for his mercy towards me, mm. King of the earth, to whom his, the Caliph's magnificence and power are known, bring gifts to him, conciliating his favor by costly presents, such as the, the King of the Germans and the King of the uh, Jebelim, the king of Constantinople and others, all their gifts pass through my hands and I am charged with making gifts in return. Let my lips express praise to the God in heaven who so far extends his loving kindness towards me without any merit of my own, but in the fullness of his mercies. I always ask the ambassadors of these monarchs about our brethren, the Jews, the remnant of the captivity, whether they have heard anything concerning the deliverance of those who have pined in bondage and had found no rest. Basically, Hazda ibn Chaprut was... Where can um, we find that? If someone says, what's the source of this thing? Uh, we will put the source in the comment section. Okay. 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 Uh, we will put all the sources, the entire text of these quotes in the first comment, the pinned comment of this video. People can go and check out okay. these sources. Okay. okay. Because we're going to be putting out a lot of stuff here. Okay. okay, so people can found the secondary and the primary sources yeah. I am quoting from. Mm. Hazda ibn Chaprut is the Prime Minister of Spain, Islamic Spain, mm. writing a letter to his Jewish counterpart, the King of Khazars uh, in Khazaria. Khazaria? Asking, Khazaria is current day Georgia, close to, okay. uh, close to Georgia. Okay. okay, this territory uh, became Jewish. It's a long story. Really? Okay, the Khazars, yeah. They, they, are, they, they are Jewish converts. Well, the whole thing. The, yeah, like the whole the whole territory. The king became Jewish, and his people also followed him century, into Jewish. Century, yeah? uh, no, this is the ninth century in particular when the the people converted. Really? Eight hundred. Okay, yeah. very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. So Hazdai had found about found out about them. So Hazdai is right writing to the kings of uh, king of Khazars, asking him whether they are the lost Jewish tribes. Mm -hmm. Which lost, lost Jewish tribes? In 721 BC, yeah. the Assyrians attacked no, the northern state of Israel. 
because after Solomon, King Solomon, Suleiman alayhi salam, and when we say Israel here, 721, this Israel is basically the Israelites, 10 tribes ruling a territory they called Israel. Oh, so this is uh, Eretz Israel, right? Yes, that's right. This because, is because the word Israel didn't really, I mean, Eretz, the land of the Israels. No, it, it was a state because yeah. they, after Solomon, yeah. King Solomon ruled a confederacy of 12 tribes yeah. of the Israelites. Yeah. After he died, the, this confederacy basically uh, split into two, two, two states. In the south, we had Judea, yeah. ruling from the capital of Jerusalem. Yeah. And in the north, we had Israel, consisting or, or of Eretz, 10 tribes. Eretz Israel. Or Israel, the state, they called it the state of Israel. Okay. Okay? Uh, it, it wasn't the current state of Israel, clearly, yeah, yeah. because they, they were religious people. Mm. They were Israelites. They had prophets among them. Okay. Yeah. So their capital was Samaria. Mm. Okay. Which is about modern day what? Uh, modern day. It's, it's close to. It's, it's in Palestine. Yeah, yeah. It's in Palestine. Okay. Uh, so 721 Assyrians are north. Mm. Um, uh, 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 this this basically dynasty or this these people Assyrians were ruling territory in northern Iraq parts of Turkey and parts of Syria. They were called Assyrians, mm -hmm. okay? A Mesopotamian uh, civilization. They attacked the the northern country of Israel. Mm -hmm. They took these 10 tribes into exile, mm -hmm. okay? And these 10 tribes disappeared from history forever. So Hazda ibn Shaprut was actually inquiring about these 10 lost tribes of Israel, mm. okay? So Hazda ibn Shaprut was a very powerful man. Why am I quoting Hazdai and what he said about his own position that he was the wazir and he was receiving all the gifts for the caliphs and he was returning these gifts to the kings so on behalf of the caliph. So this is a very powerful position. Mm. Okay. Clearly someone marginalized, someone who is disliked or hated wouldn't be in this position. That's the point I'm making. Mm. Moving on. Okay. Another character who had similar powerful position, a similar powerful position in, in, in Spain was uh, Samuel Ibn Nagrela. Samuel Ibn Nagrela was a very powerful diplomat, politician, and the prime minister of the state of Granada, mm -hmm. okay, in southern Spain. And one of his biographers called Abraham Ibn Daoud, writing, you know, in the 12th century, a Jewish chronicler, he elaborates upon Hanagid's significance for the spread of the Jewish tradition. Samuel Ibn Nagrela was also called Hanagid. Okay. So he writes, he achieved great good for Israel in Spain. The Maghrib, Afrikia, Egypt, Sicily, indeed as far as the Academy in Babylonia and the Holy City. The Academy of Babylonia was in Iraq under the rule of Islam, by the way. Mm. The Muslims were ruling Iraq at the time. Mm. Okay. He provided material benefits out of his own pocket for students of Torah in all these countries, Muslim countries. Yeah. This is a Jewish prime minister in Islamic Spain, in the state of Granada, who is doing all this benefit for what, the Jewish yeah, people. Talking about? Samuel, this is the, we're talking about the 11th century. Okay. okay? 1060s, okay. to be precise. Okay. okay. Samuel Hanagid. Samuel Ibn Nagrela Hanagid. Okay. So he basically, he was benefiting not only his own people in Spain, Islamic Spain, where the Jewish, Jew, Jewish people were living at the time. He's benefiting all the Jewish people living in Maghrib, current Morocco, Afrikia, which is Tunisia, Egypt, Sicily, and even as far as Iraq and the Holy City, which is Jerusalem. Yeah. Okay. So Abraham Ibn Daud goes on to say, he provided material benefits out of his own pocket for students of Torah in all these countries. He also purchased many books of the Holy Scriptures as well as of the Mishnah and Talmud, which are also among the holy writings. Throughout Spain and the countries just mentioned, whoever wished to devote full time to the study of the Torah found in him a patron. Moreover, he retained scribes who would make copies of the Mishnah and Talmud, which he would present to students who were unable to purchase copies themselves. Both in the academies of Spain as well as of the other countries we mentioned. These gifts were 
um, coupled with annual contributions of olive oil for the synagogues of Jerusalem, which he would dispatch from his own home. He spread Torah abroad and died at a ripe old age after having earned four crowns. The crown of Torah, the crown of power, the crown of Levite, and the towering over uh, them all by dint of good deeds in each of these domains, the crown of a good name. Samuel bin Nagrela Hanagit, the Prime Minister of Granada in Muslim Nasrid dynasty. Mm. Okay, helping all the Jewish people in Muslim territories who were living in peace and harmony in Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Jerusalem, as far as Iraq. Because so powerful was this Prime Minister, he was helping students of the Torah, the Mishnah and the Talmud, the Jewish tradition in other words. He was trying to promote Jewish scholarship, Jewish theology by patronizing all of these students and scholars in all the Muslim territories these Jewish scholars were living in. What does that tell you, Hijab? I want your commentary on this. What does that show you? No, you I mean, uh, right now this is uh, very, very um, edifying because a lot of people will be thinking, I mean... For, for a Jewish person to even reach this level of political authority. I mean, you can't argue a persecution narrative here, can you? I mean, Absolutely not. I, and this is, as you're saying, it's kind of like going into, effectively, this is the golden age. Yes. Golden age of, and I think this, this would be classified as the golden age of Islam and also the golden age of Judaism as well. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, 100%. And, and guess what, uh, Hijab? Yeah. Jewish scholars themselves have said this. I mean, Maimonides, when, when did he... Well, Maimonides was born in the 12th century right. in, in Cordoba yeah. and then he had to leave Cordoba due to a very um, difficult situation there because a new dynasty had come in, the, Al, uh, the, the no, known as al Mawahidun or al Mohads. Yeah. Yeah. They had persecuted not only the Jewish and the Christian people Muslims but the Muslims well. as yeah. well, yeah. right? So many people escaped. So Maimonides escaped to what? To where? To Muslim lands. Yeah. He, found, he left Cordoba for where? Egypt, Egypt yeah. uh, Ayyubid Egypt and became... Would he not be a surgeon or something like that? He was a, he was, he was a private physician to the Sultan himself. Yeah, yeah. Who's, which Sultan? Sultan Salahuddin, no, yeah. the famous Saladin. Mm. Yes, so Maimonides, having left Spain, a Muslim territory, for another Muslim territory in Egypt, where he became the private physician, the private doctor of Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi. So Maimonides stands as a towering figure in Jewish history. Mm. He's called the second Moses. Mm. He's also called the Rambam. Okay, mm. he's known as Rambam mm. um, in, in, within the Jewish tradition. And the reason why second it's called Moses. the second Moses, his, name, his actual name is Musa bin Maimun. Is, is, yeah, exactly. His Arabic name is Musa bin Maimun. He he even wrote his books in the Arabic language using Hebrew characters. I read a book of his actually. Uh, like, a called, guide to the perplexed. Uh, did I add a yes. Yes, yeah. a guide for a yeah, guide yeah. for the perplexed. Because he writes about kalam and stuff like exactly. that. Exactly, so. very, very, and it, and guess what? A lot of that stuff was taken from the Muslim philosophers of the he time. He took it from Ibn Rushd. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So he was heavily inspired by Muslim philosophy mm. of the time. Mm. He wrote in the Arabic language. He was pretty much a Muslim philosopher. Oh yeah, without I mean, being the, a Muslim. The arguments are very similar, to be honest. But what was the situation of the Jewish people in Spain? I mean, one can argue. That, oh, these were prime ministers. You mm. mentioned Hazda ibn Chaprut. You mentioned Samuel bin Nagrela Hanagit. And these people were very powerful, no doubt. One was a vizier, a prime minister in Cordoba. Yeah. The other one was a vizier in Granada. Okay, the, the capital city of the Nasrid dynasty of Granada. What, what about the common Jewish people living in Spain at yeah. the time? Yeah. Let's go to a rabbi. Okay. Let's go to a Jewish rabbi yeah. writing in... 1080s, okay. in the city of Cordoba, so very what, what famous. So what dynasty was this? You know, this was again the 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 aftermath. This was the Muluka Tawaif period, okay. when Muslims had already pretty much split into many different small dynasties in Spain. This is after the Umayyad Caliphate had already fallen. Okay. Okay. So we talked about the Vizier, mm. the Prime Minister of the Umayyads, speaking from Cordoba in the 10th century. Let's go on to the next century, 1080s, in the 11th century, Bahia bin Bakuda, a Jewish rabbi, he writes from the city of Cordoba in the year 1080, to be precise. And I quote him in his Kitab al-Hidayah. He wrote a treatise, okay, titled Kitab al-Hidayah. In this book, this Jewish rabbi writes, If one of our contemporaries looks for similar miracles now, 
let him examine objectively our situation among the Gentiles, Muslims in this case. Since the beginning of the diaspora and the way our affairs are managed, in spite of the differences between us and them, both secret and open, which are well known to them, let him see that our situation as far as living and subsistence are concerned is the same as theirs or even better. So Bahya bin Pakuda writing in 1080 from the city of Cordoba is saying that as far as the living conditions are concerned, we live better than the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Our living conditions are better than the Muslims. Mm -hmm. Now this is absolutely amazing. This is fascinating. Mm -hmm. How the Jewish people, having, having been liberated, from the Christian persecution of Christendom or Christian territories felt so safe and happy within the, the Muslim territory. Now, one can argue that, oh, this may be, you know, well, no. due to the goodwill of the ruler yeah. or the dynasty mm. or maybe the culture of Spain. But we can move on to other territories. Yeah, because where... some, someone will say, well, we're talking about, you know, Spain. Some some historians refer to this period as a period of convivencia, exactly coming together and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So so, so maybe now, it was the culture. It was the culture. I mean, that's mm. uh, and in fact, some some scholars say that's that's the West you're talking about. Actually, that's they've had the Western influence. Not really, because the West was absolutely devastating for the Jewish people. Let me very quickly explain okay. what was happening in the West at the time. Yeah. This is the same time when the Crusades are taking place. Mm. Pretty much about the same time. Right. The Crusades started in the 11th century, mm -hmm. soon after Bahia bin Bakuda was writing in mm -hmm. Cordoba, because he was writing in 1080s, right? Mm -hmm. And Crusades started in 1090s, mm -hmm. 1095 to be precise, when Pope Urban II delivered his speech at Clermont, and he instigated the Crusades, yep. right? In 1099, the Crusaders took the city of Jerusalem. Now, so much hate was found among Christians of the North, in Germany, France, and Britain, to be precise, because Eastern Europe was pretty much bar barbaric. They were still semi-civilized or semi-barbarized. Okay, <laughs> you know, yeah, all these territories. Some, some would really have a problem with this. Say, Look, that's, no, that's but that's a, that's a historical fact. They say that's you know that's a general sweeping generalization. No, it's it's not because because we don't know anything about Lit Lithuania and Poland and all these territories you know, at that time. from silence, they'll say, you know. But we would have any, if we had any texts, any literature, we would know about it, right? right fine. There's nothing. Yeah. It's like the Vikings. You know, the Vikings. Yeah. We don't have anything from the Vikings, unfortunately. Right. As beautiful as the artwork was. Hmm. Okay, we have found the tools, the weapons, some of the money they buried. We have found all of that. We have found the boats, okay? Some of the helmets. They, 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 were, ca they were capable of artwork. But we don't know anything. We don't know anything about them. Likewise, Eastern Europe was pretty much in darkness in that sense. In that sense, right? But Germans and the French and the the British had already taken Catholicism as their religion. Okay, they were heavily persecuting the Jewish people. Those Jewish people who existed with the Christians in the northern territories in northern Europe. Okay, they suffered severely. So when the Crusaders left their homes. Mm to go and liberate the Holy Land from the Muslims, every Jewish town, they passed, they massacred. The Jewish community of Rhineland in Germany was completely decimated, was completely destroyed. Yeah. Okay. The Jewish people were completely wiped out in Germany. In fact, those bishops and churchmen who tried to save them, they were also burnt with the Jewish people by these angry mobs of the Crusaders. Mm -hmm. Similarly, later on, uh, Richard the Lionheart, when he announced his crusade against Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi, how did he start his crusade? He started it, he started it with the Jewish people of London. Mm. A massacre against the Jewish people of London was conducted mm -hmm. when Richard was the king. It doesn't stop there. Even afterwards, when Edward the Longshank or Edward the First, the the very famous king you know, this movie, everyone's seen it, Mel Gibson's movie, uh, The Brave, Braveheart. Braveheart yeah. Okay, the king uh, depicted, and that, that movie is the king I'm talking it's about. Wildly inaccurate movie, I've heard. Yeah, it is, it is, of course, it's not historic. Yeah. Uh, movies are not generally uh, entirely historic, okay? Yeah. Uh, but there is a king depicted in the movie called Edward the Longshank. Yeah. Okay, this king also banished the Jewish people yeah. from Britain confiscated their properties, took their money because he needed money for his castle building program in, in North Wales. So mm. he needed the money and he banished the Jewish people. Mm. Likewise, the King of France also banished the Jewish people in uh, the 13th century, mm -hmm. similarly to what Edward did in, uh, in England.
Uh -huh. So the Jewish people, the question is, where were they finding refuge? In Muslim lands, uh -huh. in Muslim territories, in large numbers. That's why many Jewish historians said this repeatedly, that the majority of the Jewish people lived under the domain of Islam for over a thousand years. So you mentioned Zayn Zohar. Who else from like Jewish, what other Jewish historians have said that then? We will see. Okay, we, you'll, be, you'll be completely uh, fascinated. So that's why I'm moving chronologically. I'm yeah. going with a chronology. Okay. Right. I'm mentioning these things from different places. Yeah. From different times. Yeah. So that people don't think that we're just making things up. Yeah. And what's just... happened, you started with 7 Eleven. Yeah. Okay. But before that, you went, really, you spoke about Amr Khattab a little bit. So that's in the yeah. 7th century. So yeah. Like, yeah. like maybe around what, 640s, 650s, something yeah. like that. Yeah. And then afterwards, you, you mentioned uh, Tariq bin Ziyad. Yeah. And his conquest in 7 yeah. Eleven. Yeah. Uh, you, you mentioned. And then the Toledo consolidated. Yeah. Before that, before 7 Eleven, you mentioned yeah. the, the Council of Toledo, which is in 636, you said? 633. 633. Mm -hmm. Uh, where, whereby it was mentioned that the forced conversions. Mm. So we have here already um, a kind of preamble of what's going to happen. Yeah. Seven Eleven came along, and then uh, you mentioned Zion Zohar. Zion Zohar uh, stating in page eight of his book, yeah. History of the Jews, yeah. uh, or History of Jewry, yeah. that he mentioned that they considered the Muslims coming in as some kind of liberators. Liberators. Yes. And then, and then you mentioned we kind of skipped a couple of centuries, but we went to like the, let's say the eleventh century. And we talked about some of these uh, wazirs, if you like, in the yeah. Cordoba and Granada. Yeah. The point was that the Jewish people had had reached such powerful positions. Yeah. That they were they couldn't they couldn't possibly be marginalized. Yes. They couldn't be uh, persecuted. And what you've done that just now is you've you've spoken about what the alternative really was in uh, this Western Europe. So you spoke about Richard the Lionheart around, let's say, the eleventh century, the end of the eleventh century, and then you mentioned uh, Edward Longchamp. Yeah. as well so the jewish people always lived in a state of fear in yeah. the western world yeah in western europe in northern europe okay as late but someone accused you of being general generalizing is no i am not because yeah. uh, because the jewish historians will confirm this yeah. and we will see yeah. when i read the quotes you will be completely blown away you'll be right. shocked right. to 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 find uh that the jewish people the jewish historians themselves stated that the jews suffered severely under the rule of Christian uh, kings and dynasties. No. It was under the rule of Islam where they found refuge. The Muslims gave them refuge for over a thousand years for them to survive and flourish. We're also going to cover the Ottomans as well. Because yes. We've, we've spoken a lot about, we've spoken somewhat about, you know, the um, Khalaf al Shadiyya, yeah. the, the Rashidun Caliphate. We've spoken a lot about the the Spanish. Mm -hmm. and once again, there's going to be all that kind of discussion about bias because it's in Europe and European um, the kind of uh, prerogative that they'll say, well, that's that's because it's on our continent kind of thing. And what what about the Ottomans? I mean, someone will say, well, what about the Ottomans? Yeah, we haven't got to that yet. Obviously. We haven't got because this is why I'm moving with yeah. uh, rough chronology. So uh, you know, uh, my motive is when was when did he when was he around? Twelfth century. Yeah, okay. 12th century. Okay. Yeah. He died in 1204. Okay. Yeah. So he died in the 13th, early 13th century. He died in 1204, yeah. but he was alive in the 12th century. Okay. He was born in Cordoba and died in Egypt okay. under okay. the rule of the Ayyubids. Okay. Yeah. So another Jewish traveler called Benjamin Tudela, Benjamin of Tudela from Spain, a Spanish Jew who traveled to Baghdad in 1168 CE, again the 12th century, mm. described the situation of the Iraqi Jews in these words, he states, in Baghdad, there are about 40,000 Jews and they dwell in security, prosperity and honor under the great Caliph. And amongst them are great sages, the heads of the academies engaged in the study of the law. Could one argue, and this is good, but could one argue that, well, this is, he had to say that because if he didn't say that and it was published, the, the authorities of the time would have killed him. Well, he wasn't even publish, publishing for these authorities. This he had written when he came back to Spain. Ah, so he, he was in security. He uh -huh. was writing for his own audience, mm. for his own people. Mm. He's simply testifying to the peace and prosperity. So the fact that, that he was a traveler strengthens the Exactly. Yeah. So he came from Spain. He was yeah. a Spanish Jew yeah. who traveled to Spain. Uh, and I'm assuming... A little he, bit like Ibn Battuta. Kind, kind of. Or he, he probably... He could have traveled for two reasons. Mm. Trading or uh, seeking knowledge of the law from the sages he mentions in this quote oh, in Baghdad. 
or in Babylon. This, this the oldest Jewish community in what the Islamic world. What dynasty was this? Islamic. This was the Abbasids. The caliph at the time was Al Mustanjid. Mm. The caliph at the time ruling was Al Mustanjid, who ruled from 1160 to 1170 CE. Okay, mm. so was this when the when the Ayyubids had also established themselves? exactly the, this the, is Ayyubid dynasty, Ayyubids are not around yet. These this is the Zangid period, right? Imaduddin Zinki yeah. and his son Nuruddin Zinki. Uh -huh. so, so right Sultan before. yeah Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi is still a very young man at yeah. this time. Okay. So when Benjamin Tudila uh, when he traveled, eleven sixty eight is the year Sultan Salahuddin Ayyubi would be by this time uh, thirty one years old. Okay, uh -huh. because you were born in 1137. So the Ayyubid dynasty was established, what, 30 years after that? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so this is, this is, uh, this is, this is not the Ayyubid period yet. Mm. So, but the that Abbasid... That quite weak at the time, right? Exactly. But the Caliph did rule the territory of Baghdad or mm. around Baghdad. Yeah. So the Caliph had power in yeah. Baghdad. That's why he mentions the Caliph, that the great Caliph, uh, and amongst them are great sages, the heads of the academies engaged in study of the law. So he's talking about the Jewish rabbis mm. in Iraq, who were the most ancient community, the Jewish community in the world. Really? Since the Babylonian exile mm. that took place in the 6th century BC, to be precise, 587 BC, when the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar oh. took the, the Bible. Yeah, the exile, the famous Babylonian exile mm. into Babylon, into Iraq. Babylon was Iraq, okay, whereby the entire Israelite population, uh, whatever remained of the Israelites, because the 10 tribes are already gone. Remember, I mentioned the Assyrians came in 721 CE, uh, sorry, 721 BC, before Christ. They took the entire population into exile and they disappeared from history. We have no idea what happened to those 10 tribes of the, the Israelites. What remained was two tribes, the Benjamites and the Levites. They were taken into exile by the Babylonians in 587 BC. And this was the first time when the Temple of Solomon, Masjid al-Aqsa, was razed to the ground. This was the first destruction of the temple. Okay, so since that time, the Jewish people, some of them, never left Iraq. Even throughout the Muslim period, the Jewish people remained in Iraq. And the best Jewish scholars, the best rabbis were born in Iraq. The Babylonian Talmud was authored in Iraq and it was finished during the Muslim period. Really? Yes. It was finished during the Muslim, Muslim, Muslim period. Mm. Okay. Just around the Muslim period. You know when the Muslims it, just came. Do you know when it started? Um... It is very difficult to say when it was started. Okay. It was. St I mean, there are there are two the Talmuds. Two, the Palestinian. The Palestinian and the, the Babylonian. And it's so okay. ironic that they say yeah. that Palestine was not an entity or not a word. Yeah. And yet they have a Talmud by its name. The Palestinian Talmud, exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So the Babylonian Talmud was pretty much completed when the Muslims had already taken over mm. Iraq. Yeah. Okay, from the Sassanid Empire, and these. Jews remained in Iraq until the state of Israel was created. No. You see, the point I'm making is that the Jewish, the best Jew, Jewish scholars, mm. the topmost Jewish academy in the world, yeah. Darul Ifta, mm -hmm. where the fatwas are coming, the, 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 the rabbis in Iraq mm. were delivering fatwas for the entire Jewish community in the world. Mm. Even British Jews during the Middle Ages, when they had questions, they wrote letters to the academies of Babylon. They called it Babylon. Mm. It was Iraq during the Muslim period. So I'm pretty sure Benjamin Tudela came for similar reasons to even learn for either either learn from the scholars in Baghdad or in Iraq yeah. or for trading purpose. But the point here is security, prosperity and honor. Three words he mentions very specifically. Benjamin Tudela states in Baghdad, there are about 40,000 Jews and they dwell in security, prosperity and honor. Mm. This is a Jewish traveler from Spain testifying to the security, prosperity and honor of the Jewish people living in Iraq with the Muslims. Mm. Now, moving forward, in 1420, a rabbi called Yitzhak Safarti. Uh, so what, what are we talking about here? What, what dynasty? We're talking about now Ottomans. Yes. Okay. Oh, we're very close to the Ottoman periods. I mean, the Ottomans okay. were established here, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, pretty much in this territory. In what, 1299 or something? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he writes, okay, uh, in 1420, Rabbi 
Yitzhak Sarfati wrote a letter to his persecuted German brothers from the Ottoman Turkish territory, Adirne, from Adirne. He's writing from Adirne, a Jewish rabbi, rabbi living with the Muslims in Adirne, writes to his German counterparts, inviting them to join him in prosperous and tolerant, tolerant Islamic lands. And he, he writes, and I quote, Your cries and laments have reached us. We have been told of all the sorrows and persecutions which you suffer in German lands. Listen, my brothers, if you knew even the tenth of what God has blessed us with in this land, you would give heed to no further difficulties. You would embark at once to us. Here the Jew is not compelled to wear a yellow hat as a badge of shame. You will be free of your enemies. Here you will find peace. Rabbi Yitzhak Safarthi. Okay. Sarfati. Sarfati. Yitzhak Sarfati writing in 1420. Okay. From Adirne. From the Ottoman territory when the Ottomans are ruling Adirne. Adronopol. Okay. And he writes to German Jews to invite them to that territory. Why are you suffering in Germany? So okay. they were suffering in Germany from all the way back in the 50s. Absolutely. I, I already told you that during the Crusades. But Germany in particular. like it was Yes. The... Yeah. Germany was never friendly to the Jewish people. Mm. Is there a reason for that? Or... I, we don't know. We don't mm. know. There are many books written on this, by the way. There are chunky volumes written by Jewish historians yeah. about the persecution the Jewish people faced in Christendom in particular. But okay. they will say that Jews were enslaved at this time and the garrisons and all that. No, no. J J Jews, generally speaking, indulged in usury. Okay. Yes. Giving debts to people um, against... Um, heavy usury and this is why many the many of the jewish rabbis and the jewish merchants were hated okay you can see that in shakespeare's merchant of venice right mm. okay that 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 depiction is all is there as far as the eight as far as as late as the 16th century okay and it continues was it the case that catholics were not doing usury like that because, because in, in, there were catholics doing it yeah but many kings throughout the middle ages used Jewish people for this purpose. Okay, they were they were called kings Jews, mm -hmm. in many different places. The masses hated them because of this indulgence in usury, and whenever the masses found an opportunity to massacre the Jewish people, because they were not allowed to indulge in any other trade, the Jewish people were not allowed to indulge in any other trade. So they had found usury as a way out. Okay, and it made them, uh, uh, you know, live with relative uh, with relative ease because in jewish law it's not allowed to do usury with other jews but you can do usury with non-jews yeah this is a separate topic this is to do yeah. with the the talmudic position or well, the islamic uh, position is that you can't do it full stop absolutely it anyone. I, I, islamically we cannot do usury at all full stop give Whether, or receive but, it yeah give muslim or, or receive it exactly muslims or non-muslims mm. muslims or non-muslims give or take yeah. no usury yeah. no usury but in the jewish law the situation is different, of yeah. course, and this is what Jewish rabbis can comment on. Mm. Okay, so we were dealing with history right now. Mm. So let's talk about another quote from another rabbi, an Italian rabbi, mm. Obadia Yare di Bertinoro. Obadia Yare di, uh, sorry, da. Obadia Yare da Bertinoro traveled to Jerusalem in 1486 mm. when the Mamelukes are ruling the city of Jerusalem. Okay. Because the Ottomans only took it in 1516. Okay, so to this time, in 1486, the Mamelukes are ruling the city of Jerusalem, a Muslim dynasty. He wrote a letter to his father telling him about the country and his people. And he writes, The Jews are not persecuted by the Arabs in these parts. I have traveled through the country in its length and breadth, and none of them has put an obstacle in my way. They are very kind to strangers, unlike what the Israelis are doing today. Yeah. Particularly to anyone who does not know the language. And if they see many Jews together, they are not annoyed by it. In my opinion, an intelligent man versed in political science might easily raise himself to be a chief of the Jews as well as of the Arabs. So what this Italian rabbi having been to Italy, having, li having lived in Italy, 
the contrast he founds in Mamluk Jerusalem is that the Arabs are very kind to the Jewish people in these lands. They are not alarmed by Jewish assemblies. And if you become learned in political science, for example, if you become a politician, you can be very powerful. Mm. You can raise to higher, higher ranks, mm. uh, um, even among the Arabs. Mm. Okay. In other words, there was no Arabian apartheid. Mm. There was no mm. Muslim apartheid. Mm -hmm. The Muslims did not treat the Jewish people as riffraff, mm -hmm. as dirty people to be thrown around mm -hmm. or as someone degraded, someone you look down upon. No, mm -hmm. the Jewish people were very prosperous, very powerful, mm -hmm. very happy, very, very rich mm -hmm. in terms of economic capacity. This is what this rabbi is saying. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of evidence to go through. So let's move on very yeah, quickly. OK, so. I will also quote another Jewish rabbi. Mm. OK, actually, this is about. Uh, This is, yeah, this is another a Jewish historian called Elijah Kepsali, who describes the Jewish prosperity in the Ottoman Empire in the following way. Okay. Hmm. The Jews gathered together from all the cities of Turkey, both far and near, each person coming from his own place and community gathered in Constantinople in his thousands and his tens of thousands. The heavens helped them to the heavens helped them too, and the king provided them perfect estates and houses filled with all kinds of goodness. The Jews resided there with their families and their clans. They were fruitful and swarmed and multiplied, and the land was full of them. From that day on, whenever the king conquered a place where there were Jews, he would immediately shake them up and drive them from there and dispatch them to Constantinople the seat of his kingdom and he would pick them up and cuddle them forever mm. now since the jews feared the lord he provided them with houses filled with all kinds of goodness in a place where formerly at the time of the king of byzantium there were only two or three congregations the jews increased in numbers becoming a people with more than communities for the land could not support them altogether for their prosperity was overwhelming this is during the Ottoman period in mm. Constantinople. And his name is Elijah. Elijah Kapsali. Prosperity this is, is overwhelming. Yeah, their prosperity is overwhelming. Mm. This is unbelievable. Yeah. The Zionists have an audacity to claim that they, i.e., the Jewish yeah. people, are threatened by Islam, Muslims, or Palestinians for that matter. The Jewish people lived in these territories. For more than a thousand years without any persecution without any torture the zionist project disrupted the entire peace the zionists came in given having given this land by the british the land didn't belong to the british they gave the land to the zionist project and the zionist committed the atrocities that are unspeakable that cannot a human being cannot imagine the kind of things they did mass murder of the palestinians one million people driven out of their homes. Okay. When did the Muslims do, do this to the Jewish people is the question. When did the Muslims ever do this to the Jewish people? To the contrary, Muslims protected the Islamic civilization throughout its history. Whether the dynasties, the Ottomans, the Ayyubids or the Umayyads in Spain, the Jewish people felt secure and prosperous mm. under the rule of Islam. This is the point here that needs to be noted. So we will move on very quickly and we will see that it doesn't stop there. Another Jewish migrant, the Portuguese Jewish chronicler Samuel Usk, okay, because the Jewish chroniclers themselves testify to the Muslim kindness towards what their people. Talking? Okay, this is again. I, I will check when he was writing. I'll get back to you. But yeah. people can check. Mm. Samuel Usk. Okay. Mm. He was a Portuguese, a Portuguese Jewish chronicler. Mm. Portuguese. His name was Samuel Usk. He shed some light upon the Jewish migrants condition in the city of Salonika, which was under the Ottoman rule. Mm. Salonika is currently in Greece, but it was ruled by the Ottomans. And so long as the Ottomans ruled, the Jewish people had one of the 
most flourishing communities in this city, mm. in the city of Salonika, also known as Thessaloniki. Mm. Okay, it's in northern Greece. He writes, Samuel Usk writes, the majority of my children who have been persecuted and exiled from Europe and many other parts of the world have taken refuge in this city. And she embraces them and receives them with as much love and goodwill as if she were Jerusalem, that old and ever pious mother of ours. Mm. Okay. That old and pious mother of ours, Jerusalem, under the rule of Islam. Mm -hmm. Because it's been under the rule of Islam for nearly a thousand years already when Samuel Usk is writing. Okay. And he is equating Salonika with Jerusalem when it comes to pros prosperity and security for the Jewish people. Salonika was at this time ruled by the Ottomans when Samuel Usk was writing. Okay. Another Italian Jewish traveler, David De Rossi. Okay. An Italian Jewish traveler called David De Rossi writes, he traveled through the Ottoman Empire during the 16th century. He documented his observations about Jewish people living in Safed as follows. Safed is basically the Muslim territory, you can say. The exile here is not like our homeland. The mm. exile here mm. is not like our homeland. Mm. The Turks hold respectable Jews in esteem. Here and in Alexandria, Egypt, Jews are the chief officers and administrators of the customs. Mm. and the king's revenues. No injuries are perpetuated against them in all the empire. Only this year, in consequence of the extraordinary expenditure caused by the war against Shah Tahmasp, a Sufi, were the Jews required to make advance, advances of loans to the princes. So he's saying the Jews were so advanced and so rich that... Was he, a, what was he a chronicler, you said? No, he was an Italian traveler. Okay. Okay. Writing in the David De Rossi, writing in the 16th century. Why we how we know th this was a 16th century because there's a reference to Shah Tamasp. Tamasp was the king of Persia at the time in the 16th century. Oh, so the see. Ottomans were in a war with the Persians, and only at this time the Jewish rabbis, or sorry, not Jewish rabbis, Jewish traders, were asked to give loans to princes, Ottoman princes, to fight the war. Okay. What Persian Empire was it? The uh, Safavids. Safavids. Yeah. Safavids. Okay. Now we move on to some. Contemporary views, uh, okay. views. Yeah. Uh, recent scholarship, very quickly. Okay. Karen Armstrong notes in her history of Jerusalem that the Jews hailed the early Islamic conquest of the Byzantine lands as a mercy from God. Karen mm -hmm. Armstrong writes, Toward the end of the 7th century, a Hebrew poem hailed the Arabs as the precursors of the Messiah and looked forward to the in gathering of the Jewish exiles and the restoration of the temple. Even when the Messiah failed to arrive, Jews continued to look favorably on Islamic rule in Jerusalem. In a letter written in the 11th century, the J Jerusalem rabbis recalled the mercy God had shown his people when he allowed the kingdom of Ishmael, the kingdom of Ishmael, to conquer Palestine. What's she talking about? What year? 11th century, a Jewish rabbi wrote this letter. Yeah. Okay, she's quoting a letter. They were glad to remember that when the Muslims arrived in Jerusalem, there were people from the children of Israel with them. They showed them the spot of the temple and they settled them, uh, settled with them until this very day. So she's referring to when Omar came in, the spot of the temple was buried under rubble. The oh, Christian, so Amr al-Khattab. Yeah, yeah. So since the Jews came with the Muslims, in other words, so the, remember, the Jewish people were not allowed to live in Jerusalem from the Roman Why period. Why is she saying 11th century then? Because this, is a, this is a Jewish rabbi. She's quoting a Jewish oh, rabbi. Oh, he's speaking about... Yeah, he's speaking... So she's 11th century, exactly. about the 7th century. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. In about 750, the Jewish author of the Mysteries of Rabbi Simeon ben Yohai saw the building of the Dome of the Rock as a prelude to the Messianic age. He praises the Muslim caliph as a lover of Israel who had restored the breaches of Zion and the breaches of the what temple. What was the name of the... Does she mention the name of the... Um, of the the rabbi? rabbi? Uh, no, she doesn't mention. Okay. okay. She she simply writes that they were, they were glad to remember that when the Muslims arrived in Jerusalem, there were people from the children of Israel. Okay. 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 So she says the Jerusalem rabbis recalled the mercy. Okay. okay. She yeah. doesn't mention. So this is taken from the history of Jerusalem. Karen yeah. Armstrong's history of Jerusalem. The references will be 
in the comment section, inshallah. Yeah, yeah. And this is what I referred to earlier. This is exactly what the quote is. These are her exact words, Karen Armstrong. Yeah. The Muslims had established a system that enabled Jews, Christians and Muslims to live in Jerusalem together for the first time. Mm. These are the words of Karen Armstrong, paying a tribute to the Muslim uh, system. Professor Dean Philip Bell, who is Dean and Professor of Jewish History at Spertus Institute of Jewish Studies in Chicago, mm. writes the following. Jews under medieval Islam never suffered from the same general negative perception as in the Christian West. Despite regional variations and high medieval political instability, in medieval Islam, multicultural environments combined with active engagement in sciences and literature led to something of an Islamic golden age for the Jews, at least according to most historical accounts. It has been primarily in the context of recent political developments uh -huh. that uh -huh. the once assumed positive views of Jewish life under medieval Islam uh -huh. have been seriously questioned. Uh -huh. So anachronism has been put in play. Absolutely. Yeah. What Professor Dean Philip Bell is uh, saying here yes. is that this perception or the, uh, the, the, the perception that the Jews lived in prosperity and security throughout the Muslim territory uh, during the Muslim period or what, what they call the golden age of the Jewish people under Islam, this notion has only been questioned by recent political developments. What is he talking about? Yeah. He's talking about the State of Israel. Yes. It was only after the creation of the State of Israel when the Zionist project took this land mm. and drove out, out the Palestinians. Mm. Now, to claim superiority, mm. Uh, over this land mm. and over the civilization of the Palestinians, mm. they had to make the, the uh, Muslim civilization look bad. The narrative had to be the changed. Narrat ha the, exactly. If the narrative goes as follows, that the Jews lived in prosperity and in security, the Muslim civilization protected the Jewish people <laughs> for over a thousand years, why then do you need a Zionist state of Israel? Mm. Why can you not live with the Muslims yeah. side claim by side? Claim observation. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So they tried changing the narrative. They tried changing the image. They tried changing the perception that mm -hmm. the Jewish people ever live with Islam yeah. in prosperity and security. This is what Dean Philip Bell is talking about. Yes. The recent political developments uh, have challenged once assumed positive views of Jewish life under medieval Islam. Okay. Wow. Yeah. This is very important, by the yeah, way. And this, I mean, what we are saying today here yeah. has yeah. been noticed. Yes. or noted by yes. uh, major academics in the field. Dean Philip Bell is, the, uh, is, 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 is a dean and professor of Jewish history at, at Spertus Institute of Jewish Studies in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Another uh, quote I want to uh, very quickly share with you. I have mentioned him already. Zion Zohar, who is al also a contemporary American Jewish historian, he confirms the Jewish appreci appreciation of the Muslim arrival in Spain. Zion Zohar writes, amazingly, mm. Thus when the Muslims crossed the Straits of Gibraltar from North Africa in 711 CE and invaded the Iberian Peninsula, Jews welcomed them as liberators mm. from Christian persecution. Yeah. Then he goes on to write, yeah. Born during this era of Islamic rule, mm. the famous golden age of Spanish Jewry, circa mm. 900 to 1200 produced such luminaries as statesman and diplomat Hazdai ibn Shaprut, Wazir and army commander Shmuel Hanagid. Oh, Poet, the ones that you mentioned. The one we mentioned. Poet philosophers Solomon bin Gabriel and Judah Halevi. And at the apex of them all, Moses bin Maimun, also known among the Spaniards as Maimonides. So Zion Zohar is pretty much confirming the golden age of the house of Israel under the rule of Islam, yes, basically. So he's not only saying that the Jews welcomed the Muslims as liberators in 711 CE when they came to Spain, but the Muslims actually gave them a golden age yeah. in return. And the Jewish people, so long as the Muslims ruled Spain, lived with the Muslims. They hmm. chose to live with the Muslims. After, after the last stronghold of the Muslims fell to the Catholics in 1492, what happened to the Jewish people? All of them were completely decimated. Yeah. 
The Jewish people were in smaller number, so the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, okay, gave the Jewish people two choices. You convert or you die. You convert or you die. Mm. Many Jewish people were killed because... You're talking they, about the Inquisition. Bef this is before the Inquisition. Yeah. As soon as they took the city of Granada, mm. and of course, many of the Jewish people had to face Inquisition because some of them pretended to convert, mm. just like the Muslims did. Mm. So the Jewish people became the converses, okay, and the Muslims became the Moriscos. So we're talking about 1492 that right? 1492 onwards, mm -hmm. okay. The most difficult and brutal period in the lives of Spanish Jews as well as Muslims. Mm -hmm. Then we move on to the... After that, would you is it correct to say that, okay, well, they, they then moved to the Ottoman Empire? Yeah, many did. Yeah, Absolutely. Many did. This is a very good point. Yeah. Timely mention of the, the Jewish removal to the Ottoman territories. Those Jewish, those Jews, very few of them who could escape, where did they escape to? to Ottoman territories. They came to places like Salonika. They came to places like Constantinople. Mm. They came to places like mm. Jerusalem. Now, the question is, those Jewish people who were living in Jerusalem during the Ottoman period, what happened to them? Mm. The Ottomans took the territory of Syria, Palestine and Hejaz mm. from the Mamluks in 1516. Sultan Salim conquered these territories. Mm. And having conquered these territories, he claimed to be the first Ottoman Caliph. Mm -hmm. What happened after that? We have a Jewish historian who studied in two volumes mm. the, the Jewish life as reflected in Muslim court documents from the sigil of Jerusalem. Mm. Okay, the 16th century. Is this the Ottoman sigil? This is the Ottoman sigil. Look, just just to explain what the sigil is then to the people, because recently um, I'm, I used the sigil myself a few times. It's, written, it's, it's this one that's written in Ottoman Turkish, right? Y yes. Yeah, so they've actually digitized this sigil. Yes. And it's, it's now part of, you can go online and there's a there's a whole website that the Turkish government is, I think, responsible Absolutely for. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, amazing. And even, even, even this Jewish historian from Israel, yeah. his name is Amnon Cohen, who has studied these uh, these particular records he has published the facsimiles in in these two volumes so you can see the facsimiles there as well right so what is this this is basically a study of the jewish uh, sorry a jewish study of the muslim court records from the city of jerusalem which, in the 16th which century which to jewish people yeah we, uh -huh. just just relating to the jewish people uh -huh. okay so, 16th century yeah? okay let me very quickly explain right this is a study of the Muslim court records yes. from the city of Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem. Okay. okay. Yeah. And the records he studies are for 70 years. Yeah. From 1500 to 1570. 1500? Okay. 1500? To 1570. This is the record he yeah. studies. So he studies the record of the Muslim court record. Who is who's in China? Bayezid and uh, what? Uh, sorry? Who is, who is the... The historian, the, no, the, the caliphs at the time. Uh, this is basically the early um, Mamluk period and then during the reign of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Okay. Sultan Suleiman came to power in 1520 mm -hmm. and he ruled until 1566. So pretty much you this got, is... You've done that from memory, right? Yeah, yeah. Mashallah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is so, why, this yeah. is why, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go ahead. So this is pretty much the entire reign of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent. Yes. One of the most powerful Ottoman sultans. I mean, he's, he's the one who's... Uh, who besieged that, Vienna. And also you got the beautiful mosque. Yeah, Suleimania, and he's the one who besieged Vienna. This is yeah, how powerful yeah. he was. Yeah, yeah. In 1533, he besieged right? the city of Vienna. Mm -hmm. it, it pretty much nearly took Europe. Okay. Wow. Yeah, so... The siege of Vienna. Yeah, the siege of... The famous siege of Vienna. Okay. Mm. That sent shivers down the European... Uh, uh, Spine. intellectuals <laughs> European spines yeah even 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 Martin Luther <laughs> wrote about it the okay. Protestant yeah uh, Protestants yeah because yeah. exactly. he was around the same time right exactly yeah. he's, he's next door 17 right yeah yeah that's exactly. what he wrote his yeah. Protestant yeah. He's, he was a contemporary mm. and he's next door yeah he's in Germany oh right right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and this was the siege of Austria okay Vienna oh, right. and okay. he wrote about that yeah he, he mentions it so now Amnon Cohen who yeah. is a contemporary Israeli Jewish scholar yeah. he studied 
uh, the the Muslim court record for these seventy years. Very interesting. And his interest was simply in the Jewish cases. Really? Yeah. He was specifically studying the Jewish cases. Yes. He was checking if the Jewish people were were applying uh -huh. for, for justice. And just just at the Muslim court. One more point about the sigil, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the Arabic word is probably the same as the Turkish one. Here, sigil literally means the record, effectively the sigil. Um, and one more thing about it, the Ottoman Empire probably has, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it probably has the most preserved court records, probably in all of Islamic Absolutely, history. absolutely. This is why he was able to study it, okay? And the book is titled, A World Within. A World Within, Jewish Life as Reflected in Muslim Court Documents from the Sigil of Jerusalem, 16th Century. So, you know, what did he find? What did he, yeah, find? What did he find? Let's, 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 let's study his findings. Mm. He writes... Cases concerning Jews cover a very wide spectrum of topics. Okay. If we bear in mind that the Jews of Jerusalem had their own separate courts, the number of cases brought to Muslim court, which actually meant putting themselves at the mercy of a judge outside the oh, pale. So they of had their own separate courts. There yeah, well. they had their own separate court, courts called Beth Dins. Mm -hmm. Re rabbinical courts were available. Can I make a point about that? Just, just that, that level of autonomy and if you want to call it that and it's no it was a loaded term but pluralism right that was afforded legal yeah pluralism i mean for, for jewish people yes yeah, it's, it's, it's unlike even what we're we're granted here in the west 100 percent. there is no precedent um uh sorry there is no example of it yeah there is no example of it today even in the most secular the liberal islamic states. sharia courts are not affected they're ineffectual 100 percent. they don't have legal power secular states as liberal as they may be like sweden norway denmark even they don't allow judicial judicial autonomies to minorities yeah the islamic system allowed judicial autonomies to the christians as well as the jews and that's because so, of the prophetic commands and that's because of the actions of the Holocaust. absolutely why would muslims force their religion and law upon mm. the jewish people mm. they have their own law let them rule by their own mm -hmm. law so they were beth dens in jerusalem what are they called beth dens mm. beth dens b-e-t-h mm -hmm. dens d-i-n-s okay? okay so we continue with the um, amnon cohen's quote so he's saying that uh, the Jewish people were applying to the Muslim court, which actually meant putting themselves at the mercy of a judge outside the pale of their communal and religious identity. It's quite impressive. The Jews went to Muslim court for a variety of reasons, but the overwhelming fact was their ongoing and almost permanent presence there. Okay. Mm. This indicates that they, were, uh, they went there not only in search of justice, but did so hoping, or rather knowing, that more often than not, they would attain redress when wronged. The Jews went to court to resolve much more than their conflicts with Muslims or Christian neighbors. They turned to Sharia authorities. This is Amnon Cohen, by the way, mm -hmm. a Jewish historian from Israel writing this. Okay, They turned to Sharia authorities to seek redress with respect to internal differences and even in matters with their immediate family intimate relations between husband and wife nafaka maintenance payments to divorcees support of infants etc etc this is the jewish people in the 16th century coming to the muslims muslim judges qadis despite the fact uh, that they have their own courts in the city of Jerusalem where the rabbis are ruling over those courts or mm. he goes on to say their possessions are protected about the Jewish people now he's writing a conclusion having discussed the the law how it dealt with the Jewish cases the Muslim law and the fact that the the Jewish people are found to be permanently present in the Muslim court applying for justice uh, and over a thousand cases mm. were filed within these 70 years. Mm. Over a thousand cases were filed within these 70 years. He goes on, Amnon Cohen goes on to say, their possessions were protected, although they might have had a pay for, they might, ha they might have had to pay for extra protection at night for their houses and commercial properties. Their title deeds and other official documents indicating their rights were honored when presented to the court, being treated like those of their Muslim neighbors. The picture emerging from the sigil documents is baffling. On the one hand, we encounter recurring 
sultanic decree sent to Jerusalem in response to pleas of the Jews to the effect that nothing should be done to stop them from applying their own law regarding a variety of matters. There are also many explicit references to the overriding importance of applying Sharia law to them only if they so choose. On the other hand, if we look closely at some of the inheritance lists, we see that the local court allocated to female members of Jewish families half the share given to male members exactly as in Islamic law. This meant ipso facto a significant improvement in the status of Jewish women with respect to legacies over that accorded them by Jewish tradition. Although it actually meant the application of Islamic law in, 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 an, in an internal Jewish context. He, the Muslim judge, defended Jewish causes jeopardized by high-handed behavior of local governors. He enabled Jewish businesses, business people, he enabled Jewish business people and craftsmen to lease properties from Muslim endowments on an equal footing with Muslim bidders. More generally, he respected their rituals and places of worship and guarded them against encroachment, even when the perpetrators were other Muslim dignitaries. So the conclusion is from Amnon Cohen, having presented all this evidence and these findings after he studied the sigil record of the city of Jerusalem in the 16th century, the Ottoman sigil, sigil record, his conclusion is, no one interfered with their internal organization or the external cultural and economic activities. Talking about the Jewish people. In a world where civil and political equality or positive social change affecting the group or even the individual were not the norms, the Sultan's Jewish subjects had no reason to mourn their status or begrudge their conditions of life. The Jews of Ottoman Jerusalem enjoyed religious and administrative autonomy within an Islamic state. And as a constructive dynamic element of the local economy and society, they could and actually did contribute to its functioning. Therefore, the Jewish people of the city of Jerusalem during the Ottoman period were very powerful, very prosperous, very free to apply their own law to themselves or, if they so chose, the Sharia law yep. in their affairs. All of this evidence, Brother Muhammad Hijab, yes. presented to our audiences and the Jewish audiences and the Christian audiences out there. What does it prove? It proves that throughout the Muslim period, Throughout the history of the Muslim civilization, for over a thousand years, the Jewish people prospered, lived in harmony, and um, flourished, and were honored according to the testimonies of the Jewish historians, travelers, rabbis themselves. Today, the evidence I presented by the Muhammad Hijab in this presentation, mm -hmm. or this, in, in this podcast, mm -hmm. none of the evidence I presented is for Muslims. <laughs> Not one piece of evidence came mm. from the Muslims. All the testimonies, all the studies, all the academic opinions we presented here today in this podcast are from the Jewish authorities. And for them, for someone then to make a claim of uh, a claim of conspiracy would be absurd, wouldn't it? So you've got all these different accounts from different historical periods, different geographies, different places in Spain, in Greece, in Iraq, uh, in the Ottoman Empire. They can't all be saying the same thing and lying or consp conspiring with it one another. It would be a global conspiracy going on for a thousand years. Yes. Because these testimonies, you know, they are from, as you said, different places, different times, different people, facing different circumstances, different yeah. situations, different dynasties. But there is one thing common in all of these testimonies. Prosperity of the Jewish people, mm. their honor, mm -hmm. their protection, mm -hmm. their security. That's correct. Okay. And you've read that out. Exactly. So, so no one, no one can, in his right mind, deny this evidence. It's like denying the sun. So, when the Zionists come out today, just like they have been, they have been denying that they are committing a genocide against Palestinian yep. children. Nothing they say can be taken seriously. They are a bunch of liars. Absolutely. When they say that the Jewish people are threatened by Muslims or by Palestinians, they are a bunch of liars. Muslims are nev never, never anti-Jewish. If Muslim civilization or the Muslim dynasties or the Muslim armies wanted the Jewish people dead, there would be no Jew alive today in the world. Absolutely. There would be no Jewish community alive in the world because they were being persecuted and killed 
in Western Europe and Northern Europe, and they found refuge with the Muslims. And Muslims took them in as cousins, mm. as their own, and gave them reasons to be happy, reasons to flourish. So this propaganda, after this podcast, can be put to rest forever. Any Zionist who opens his mouth ever again yes. about Muslims being anti-Jewish, Muslims being anti-Semitic, Muslims after Jewish blood, Muslims wanting a massacre or a genocide of the Jewish people, just send this link to them. Just send, send the, the video to them. Absolutely. I think you've completely annihilated the claims. And I, I think, hope so. I think in order for someone to, to actually make a case against you, they would be having to... Uh, it's not just hermeneutical di uh, gymnastics. They're going to have to be ahistorical. Absolutely. They will have to speak. Look, if I had quoted the primary sources and put my own spin on them, yeah. it would be a different matter. I had quoted the primary sources and the secondary sources, and the secondary sources yeah. of modern scholars, yes. Jewish modern yeah. scholars. None of them are Muslim. None of them are Muslims. But they're Jewish and they're saying the same thing I'm saying. Yes. Why are they saying? The Jewish people flourished throughout the Muslim history. They, were, they, they witnessed, they experienced the golden age whereby they produced some of the best intellectuals in the history, their best rabbis, their best poets, their best scientists, their best intellectuals, their best physicians, their best everything, their best vizirs and generals were born throughout the Muslim period in Muslim territories. Beautiful. I think, I think that's fantastic. I think this is really good information. People from the non-Muslim community outside of Islam, now they can really look at Islam properly and look at the history of Islam properly. Absolutely. And with that, we will conclude. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much for honestly. giving me this opportunity. And uh, we'll put the um, all the references that he mentioned in the uh, in the comment section, in pinned comment, and also in the description box. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. MashaAllah, you're still here. Just make sure that you donate by clicking the link below because the rewards are unimaginable.